This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott, and I'm going to read you a bedtime story. Welcome to part three of the incredibly controversial series, Obscene. If you missed parts one and two, please go listen to them first. Part one is episode 268, and part two is episode 276. I'll wait. Not that this author needs any introduction, but... Andrew Parker enjoys symbiosis, reproducing asexually, and eating as much as possible, as often as possible. Andrew Parker hates x-rays, MRIs, and CAT scans. Andrew Parker is definitely not infected with a giant sentient parasitic worm, and no, you did not just see his flesh wriggling. That was just a trick of the light. And with that, I present to you part three of Obscene. I had no idea if anyone was still looking for me, but after everything that had happened, I didn't want to take any chances if they were. These people had already proven themselves capable of extreme violence. I had their money. I had their videos. I wasn't safe. Maybe it would be wiser to just throw the hard drive away and forget about the money. That was obviously how they had tracked me down last time, tracing the Bitcoin, but fuck that. I had suffered and lost way too much to just walk away empty-handed. My hand was permanently disfigured, and my best friend had been murdered in an absolutely horrific fashion. Maybe it didn't matter at all. Zuzu was dead. So was Animal and the director. So, maybe I was good. Maybe there wasn't anyone else to come for me. Maybe I was off the hook. Then again, who was the vile doctor on the computer that disemboweled Ashton? An associate? It gave me a chill to think that there was a, a whole network of sadistic freaks like I'd already met, and it was starting to appear that that was the reality of my situation. The other reality was that I was broke and on the run. I had paid for a week in this shitty motel, but after that, my wallet would be about empty. I needed to meet with the Bitcoin buyer again. I had already made the meeting, I just had to do it and disappear. We had set the exchange at the same location as before. The grocery store. $700,000 in cash for the remainder of my Bitcoin. Seven hundred thousand dollars. It wouldn't last forever, but it was enough that I could go anywhere and completely disappear. I could buy a, a new identity wherever I wanted. This was it. Time to start my new life. One free of the horror and violence of my old one. Free of the addiction, self-loathing, and self-destruction. I didn't really know how to travel with that kind of cash. I was pretty sure I couldn't just walk into an airport and check a suitcase with that much money without TSA and all manner of government agencies wanting to talk to me. But I was sure I'd be able to find someone to help with that. No questions asked. It wouldn't be too hard to put some feelers out. I'd drive a few states over, get a hotel room in cash, and then I'd just... 
figure it out. I was feeling pretty optimistic when I pulled Ashton's car into the parking lot of the meet. I walked into the store daydreaming about my future. The buyer sat at the table with her back to me. I came around and pulled out the chair to sit. I was about half sat down when I saw her face. Her skin was pallid and her eyes were rimmed and red. She was shaking like a leaf. Very not good. I'm sorry. She whispered breathlessly to me. She looked absolutely petrified. Oh, Jesus Christ, I thought. It's a fucking setup. I jumped to my feet, turned on my heel, and started running back to my car. In the parking lot, a white panel van screeched to a halt in front of me, cutting off my escape route, and the door slid open. Three masked men jumped out like a surprise birthday party from hell. I moved to pull out the 3D printed gun from my pants, but they were much faster than me. Their hands were at my wrists, twisting them behind my back before I could even reach for it. It was coordinated and mechanically efficient, as though they had practiced and performed this many times before. A rag was clamped over my mouth and I tasted chemical sweet ether on the back of my tongue before I lost consciousness. That old joke song began to play in my head. They're coming to take me away, ha ha, ho ho, hee hee, to the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time. I wasn't so sure the farm I'd be going to would be so funny or wonderful, though. I came to in a seated position. I tried to stand, but I found myself immobile. There he is. Welcome back to the world of the living, said a silhouette standing over me. I shut my eyes hard and shook my head, trying to clear out the blurriness and pull myself out of the ether fog. As my vision improved, I could see the man more clearly. He was somewhat well-dressed, a suit jacket over an untucked floral print button-down, and the top three buttons were undone, exposing sparse chest hair, pressed slacks, and dress shoes. He kind of looked like if a speedball shot was a person. Who the fuck are you? I asked, assessing my surroundings. It was some sort of industrial building. Concrete and bare. I was tied to the chair at the wrists and ankles, and I was facing a blank screen on the wall. I am a fan, Mr. Balasong. A huge fan, said the figure. You can call me Atrax. I'd like to show you something. Do I have a choice? I asked, knowing I didn't. Indulge me he said, motioning to the screen. He looked back and snapped his fingers at one of the henchmen who'd helped kidnap me, who was manning a laptop and projector. As the video began, the scene opened on that derelict building, filth-caked and graffiti-laden. I did not want to watch this, not one little bit. I looked to Atrax and he was watching, engrossed. On the screen, Zuzu punched and kicked me until I fell limp to the concrete. After a cut, I was being restrained to the Andrew's cross. Smelling salts were held under my nose and I snapped awake, struggling against my restraints. The hulking fucker animal, now dead, injected me with a syringe. I jabbered angrily at the camera, and then Animal's fist entered the frame, decimating my mouth. Blood, vomit, and bits of teeth rushed from my mouth in several rapid, foul gouts. As the scene played out in front of my eyes, I grappled with the feelings it dug up. It's a surreal feeling to watch the worst moment of your life from a perspective different than your own. Especially strange to watch from the point of view of the moment's perpetrator. 
It was sick and voyeuristic and made me face the diseased reality that it was created for someone else's entertainment. Watching it through the eye of the camera, I could imagine the thought process going through that freak director's head, and even worse, its intended audience. This was something I didn't want anyone to see, much less some sadistic chud who would be getting off to it. I didn't like it. I wanted the thoughts to leave my mind, but it was impossible to shake them loose. I was being forced to stare down my own helpless exploitation. It was humiliating, invasive, and infuriating, being made to relive this so explicitly. This moment that changed my life sent me down the road to hell. I was a literal captive audience to my own hopeless destruction. On screen, Animal began to taunt me with a scalpel before stabbing me deep in my leg. He left the frame and came back with a nail gun, proceeding to nail my hand to the cross. My hand came free from the wood and I smacked him upside the head with the iron manacle around my wrist. I watched cringing as in the film I dragged the scalpel that had been buried in my thigh across my wrist and screaming wrenched myself free skinning my hand it had happened so fast when it occurred that I barely thought about it and I had tried not to think about it much since played back like this it was fucking gruesome I looked at the same hand's current state of grotesque deformity, knowing now it was definitely the right choice. Right hand for my life? Fair trade. I was never any good at guitar anyways. Now this, Atrax said, visibly excited. This is my favorite part. On screen... I smashed the mallet down on Animal's head multiple times until it caved in. Oh, 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 wow. Atrax cheered as Animal's eyeball popped out of the leather mask. You don't see that every day. I charged toward the camera, hunkering down for a full body tackle, and then the film abruptly stopped. Don't leave just yet. We've still got the after credits scene. The next thing to play on the screen was in full widescreen aspect, and this one was in higher resolution. There were two men whom I recognized as the goons who'd kidnapped me. God damn, someone went fucking ape shit on these poor fucks, said the first. Yeah, I think we can rule out natural causes on this one, the other said beginning to wrap the director's smashed head in saran wrap. Can the doc use these? The first man asked. Nah, not fresh enough, said the other. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ, man. Look at this! The first guy said to the cameraman, holding up my discarded hand skin. The other henchman leaned in for a look. What the fuck? He said, flicking at the deflated fingertips. It's still got the fingernails and everything. It looked like a used condom. The goon tossed the sloughed skin onto the director. It made a muffled, wet splat when it landed on his chest. The toady lifted him at the ankles, dragging him away. Then the other lackey began to splash bleach all around the filthy concrete. It was a cleanup crew. This explained why nothing had ever hit the news about the massacre. No one ever knew about it. There was nothing to find. The screen went white again for a moment. And now the sequel. Atrax announced. Another video began. It was from the perspective of a computer's forward-facing camera. In Ashton's office... I could be seen approaching the desk, gun in hand. The screen catches my attention, and I stand watching, my mouth going slack as I viewed the abominable stream. As I stared, 
horror writ on my face. A masked Zuzu crept out from the shadows behind me. All of a sudden, I reached behind the camera and the video cut off. The screen cut to a handheld of Zuzu, presumably recorded by the same cleanup crew. She was gray and lifeless. Boss is gonna be pissed about this one, said the man behind the camera. They rolled her up in the carpet from the floor of Ashton's office and dragged her out of the room before grabbing Ashton's computer on the way out. The film ran out and the screen went white. Atrax began slow clapping. Bravo! What a performance. You completely eradicated one of our remote cells. Very impressive. What do you want? To finish the job? I spat. I hated being patronized by this freak. Just fucking kill me already. Get this over with. You want your fucking money? Have it. The key is on the hard drive around my neck. The money? He scoffed. You can keep it. They won't be needing it anymore. Think of it as a signing bonus. You are going to work for me. I am invested in your character arc. You're no stranger to violence and you are fluent in the language of suffering. Let's be real. What you've done here is performance art. It's shocking. It's compelling. It's beautiful. I think we can do great things together. You see, aside from being a connoisseur of art, I'm a businessman. Now, I'll admit, you annihilating my employees has been bad for business, but you are clearly very good at killing. And since killing is my business, if you work for me, business will be good. Right? He said, spelling out his logic as if it was simple common sense and not homicidally psychotic. And if I refuse... Well, I'll fucking kill you. Simple as. I hung my head in defeat. It was plainly obvious I didn't have much choice in the matter. There's someone else I'd like you to meet. Atrax nodded to someone behind me, and a hunched, wiry man made his way to the front of the screen next to him. He wore a large rubber apron and had on latex gloves. After a moment, I could see it was the doctor from the live stream that had disemboweled Ashton. Meet Nadir Aziz Yasarif, or as we like to call him, Dr. Vulture, our resident surgeon. He was fundamentally unsavory. An evil smile showed nicotine-stained teeth as he leered at me. I stared daggers at him, trying to burn a hole through his head with my mind, willing him to drop dead. This motherfucker had murdered my only remaining friend. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Balasong. He said, condescendingly. The pleasure is all yours, cocksucker. He crossed over to me, grinning, and pressed his fingers into my face, testing my flesh and its elasticity. I bit at his fingers. Mmm, very good. Strong. Vital. Angry. Why? Why are you doing this? I demanded. Organs, Dr. Vulture said creepily. His eyes sparkled lasciviously as he said it. Atrax cut in. You've heard those stories of a guy getting picked up by a beautiful woman out of his league at a bar? He asked rhetorically. Next thing he knows, he's waking up in a tub full of ice in a cheap motel missing a kidney. I nodded. That's money. 
A healthy kidney will fetch over a hundred thousand dollars on the black market, and this is well worth the cost to someone with cash and a life-threatening disease. There are plenty of folks out there. There's a thriving black market for organ donation. Poverty-stricken countries like the Philippines are destinations for people desperate for an organ transplant and willing to grapple with the moral quandary of accepting a less-than-altruistic donation from someone destitute enough to sell a kidney or what have you to a total stranger. Like it or not, it's a billion-dollar industry. But when you only take a kidney, you're just leaving. So much money on the table, so to speak. In my opinion, at least. He grinned, pausing. The victim is likely to die anyway, so why not go for the whole kitten caboodle? As I said, kidneys go for over a hundred thousand dollars each. Corneas for fifteen, liver a hundred ten, lungs. A quarter of a million. And a healthy heart will get you half a million dollars. That's over a million dollars per person. So where do I fit in here? Why do you need me? Atrax smiled evilly. (laughs) That's the best part. Of course, the donor doesn't survive when you take everything, so hey... Here's an idea. Since you're just killing the poor fucker while you're at it, might as well make some money with the death. There are some sickos on the internet who pay to watch these live organ donations. Doesn't really matter if the patient dies sedated or if they die screaming. As long as the precious organs are unharmed, you can do whatever you want to the rest of the body. Living donor cadaver. What's the difference? Think of it as using every part of the kill. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps, and rush dinners. Factors 2-Minute Meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals, free up time otherwise spent on. Shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, They also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to -to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code scareyoutosleep50 at factormeals.com. 
As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life, and one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on, and something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. How very new age of you, I said mockingly. He ignored me. We provide a good service, and that is where you fit in. You see, anyone can go on the internet and watch a video of someone being murdered, but it's all the same uninspired drivel. It lacks that, uh, je ne sais quoi. There's no heart there, no panache. He went on, bloviating. So, we fill that void. We produce videos for an audience with a more libertine palette. So, to answer your question, that is where you fit in. (laughs) He grabbed a handful of my hair, wrenched my head back, and the doctor inserted a dropper into my nostril. I felt a liquid drip into my sinus cavity and began to burn chemically. I tasted something very bitter, and the back of my throat began to numb. The fuck is that? I protested, trying to blow whatever it was out of my nose. Dr. Vulture smiled, knowingly. Datura, he explained, continuing to hold my head back so the fluid could run down the back of my throat. It contains scopolamine, which used to be used as a sort of truth serum by the KGB. Nowadays, criminals use it to make a victim suggestible and compliant. They dose someone with this and they'll go and empty their bank account willingly. It eliminates free will and it'll help with any apprehensions you may have. Atropine as well, which is notorious for its deeply unpleasant hallucinations. It'll make you hot as a hair, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. He continued, finally releasing my head. I snorted back as much as possible of the bitter fluid and spat it onto the floor. Oh, also, a synthetic cathinone. Atrax added. Basically, bath salts. It will induce agitated delirium. That way we can really tap into that savage instinct of yours. He said, raising his eyebrows in anticipation. At this, Atrax whistled and the door opened. Another man pushed a hooded figure into the room. He pulled the hood off, and I could see it was the Bitcoin buyer. My stomach turned to lead, and it felt like it had dropped through the floor. Another innocent person had been dragged into this hell with me. First Ashton, now this woman. Atrax walked around behind her. He pulled a switchblade and stuck the point into the meat right next to her eye. She was trembling with fear. A runnel of blood trickled down her face and turned pink as it mixed with her tears. 
Oh, come on. She's got nothing to do with any of this. I said, defeated. I already knew it was too late to plead for her fate. Uh, I'll do whatever you want. Just... Just let her go. Atrax laughed derisively. <laughs> he nodded to the henchman behind me, who then began to loosen my restraints. Once I was free, he allowed me to stand, but held me by the shoulders. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to hurt her. With this, he flicked the knife down, cut the zip tie restraining her at the wrist, placed the handle of the switchblade into her opened hand, and gently closed her fingers around it. She gaped at him, confused. Atrax then removed another blade from his lapel pocket and held it out, offering it to me. The stooge broke his hold on me and backed away. No. I slurred, realizing what the implication was. No way. I slapped the blade out of his hand and it skittered across the metal floor. But it was weirdly difficult. It took every ounce of my willpower to do it, and I could feel that willpower slipping away. My vision was beginning to blur and my skin felt hot and flushed. My heart began to jackhammer as well, pounding away to the beat of an insane, paranoid drum. I looked at Atrax, furious. His face was beginning to take an uncanny valley sort of appearance. Ghoulish and otherworldly. The flames of rage licked at my soul, threatening to ignite the very atmosphere around me like an atomic bomb. I hated this bastard. No! I protested. No, I'm not going to do this. She hasn't done anything. She doesn't deserve this. I slurred. My mouth was impossibly dry. Atrax laughed. <laughs> you don't have a choice. Winner takes all here. No, please, no. This isn't happening, said the buyer. You both want to live, yes? He said, pulling a handgun from beneath his coat. It was one of those comically large Desert Eagle 50 caliber jobs. An action movie gun. Wildly impractical, but extremely intimidating when pointed in your face. Yes. She whispered, harshly, staring down at the floor. Atrax pointed the barrel of the gun into her forehead and pushed her head up so she was looking him in the eyes. He cocked the hammer back showing he meant business. Then, you'll fucking do it. Or you'll both fucking die anyways. Please. She begged. I, I have a daughter. A family. I, I, I... At this point, he pointed the pistol's barrel away from her, just next to her ear, and pulled the trigger. She screamed and fell to the floor, grabbing her ear, which began to leak blood. Now, get to it. I'm getting impatient, he demanded. He crossed the room and took a seat in a director's chair in the corner. He snapped his fingers again, and one of the goons opened up a handy cam and began to film. I heard the beep as the camera indicated recording had begun. Sobbing. She half-heartedly lurched towards me, swinging her blade in a big telegraphed arc. I ducked it easily, even in my drugged state. Blubbering, she turned and tried again. Her desperation was increasing, which would only make it easier to outmaneuver her. I felt an out-of-body sensation, dissociative, as if I was viewing this moment from the third person. It helped me remove myself from what I knew had to come next. Realistically, there was no scenario where they let this woman live. She knew too much, and I didn't even want to imagine 
what they had planned for her if she survived this. The most merciful thing I could do for her was to give her a quick death instead of drawn out torture. This is what I let myself believe, at least. With the next swing of the knife, I sidestepped her and grabbed her by the wrist with my good hand. She snatched the blade with her free hand and stabbed at me. I brought my damaged right hand up to block her swing and the knife stabbed straight through my deformed palm. With all the nerve damage, all I could feel was pressure from the perforation. I wrenched it from her grasp, yanked on her arm, and twisted her around, smoothly sliding my right arm around her neck. Then, pulling her in, I put my left hand on the back of her head and pushed as I squeezed the crook of my arm against her throat. A perfect, rear naked choke. She struggled against the hole. I leaned back and her kicking feet lifted off the floor. I tried to make it as fast as possible, compressing her neck as hard as I could like a boa constrictor. A proper blood choke will render a person unconscious in about 10 seconds. It's painless, but still terrifying. As she futilely bucked against my strength, tears streamed from my eyes and I kept repeating into her ear, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. She went limp, becoming dead weight pretty quickly. Five minutes. Five minutes of compressing the carotid and jugular arteries is enough to induce brain death. Those five minutes felt like a lifetime for me as I held her tight, like an unwanted lover. I squeezed my eyes closed and groaned loud trying not to hear the noises she was making. After a bit, she regained some sort of consciousness and thrashed with all the might of her panicked nervous system. Then, she convulsed for a bit, and finally went limp again. She was done. I'm sorry, I said once more, hoping for some sort of forgiveness. I released her from the choke, and we both fell to the floor. I flopped onto my back, chest heaving from exertion. Oh, oh, this is incredible. Very, very dramatic. It's like a Greek tragedy. Atrax said, beaming with pride at his bright idea to use me. At this point, blackout washed over me like a rolling tide my tenuous grasp on reality slipping through my fingers like so much sand. When the wave of blackout receded, I found myself still delirious and hallucinating, but at least conscious. I was laying on a stained cot in a shipping container. The walls breathed and rippled. The ceiling dripped with amorphous black ichor that formed pointed fractal shapes like magnetic ferrofluid. I had no idea how much time I had lost to this delirium. It could have been hours. It could have been weeks. I just didn't know. God knows what they made me do in my furor. I saw in my horror that my arms were caked and dried black blood up to the elbow, and there were bits of flesh and blood stuck beneath my fingernails. In the center of the floor was an empty plate smeared with blood. I quickly averted my gaze from it. I had an idea what it meant, but I didn't want to acknowledge it. As I continued to assess my surroundings, I found there was a large bucket full of a slurry of excrement and a jug of water next to the bed. I twisted off the cap and drank greedily. I'd never been so thirsty in my life, and it seemed the dryness was unquenchable. I choked on the water, causing my stomach to clench and revolt against me. I vomited into the bucket, and the rush that erupted from my belly tasted strongly of iron. 
don't want to think too deeply into that. My surroundings began to shift. The space expanded, I hallucinated that all around me was a dank swamp. The shiny floor transformed into dark, dirty water. My cot was a rowboat as I assessed my new surroundings. A bald, veiny head began to emerge from the still water. The face was featureless. A blank slate except for a wide mouth with thin, purple-blue lips. The skin was a sickening gray tone, the color of waterlogged bodies that washed up near docks. Its skin was flecked with swamp litter, tiny leaves, bits of algae, and a clump of moss draped over its shoulder. It began to trudge through the water in my direction. A pair of turtles, sunbathing nearby on a toppled, rotting tree, dove into the murky water. I was frozen in fear. It stopped when it was a few feet away from me, then it just stared at me. The smell of it was awful. The stench of the swamp mixed with that of putrefaction. I watched in disgust as lumps began to form under its gray, dead skin. One of the lumps under his arm bulged out and began to stretch the flesh. It distended to an unbelievable and horrifying extent, and just when I thought it could get no worse, the skin breached with a sickening wet pop and a spew of blood. From out of the fresh fissure emerged an arm. I gagged. The creature just looked at me and smiled, mouth full of brown, rotting teeth. This continued. Stretch. Pop. Stretch. Pop. And three more arms emerged. One more on his left side, and two out of his back. These two had two joints so they could hang above the body like a scorpion's tail. Ready to strike. It reached towards me with its bottom left arm. Do you see? It inquired in a guttural hiss. Before I could answer, it said... It brushed this hand along a row of tall reeds protruding from the water, and the plants withered and died instantly. Its blank face changed to that of the buyers. The innocent woman I had killed. A mask of grief and angst. She held me with her stare, her eyes hypnotic and haunting. A hand reached out and touched me in the middle of my forehead, and I felt something leave me. Like a weight being removed. Maybe it was my soul. Whatever it was that made me human. I recalled an interview I'd seen with an old Vietnam War veteran discussing the inhuman cruelty he had seen and taken part in while deployed. There is a primitive, obscure darkness in the collective subconscious, and with provocation, it can slip out as violent action. A normal person is blissfully unaware of the awful ways it can express itself. They have an assumed moral certainty that they don't have it in them. They do not feel that way, never could, but they are never really far out of touch with it. Most people go their whole life not having to recognize they have that capacity in them. They don't ever suspect it. They would be horrified to learn the unbearable reality of what we are capable of. 
They're just very fortunate that the circumstances of their lives have never put them in a position, backed them into a corner where they have to access it. So they never get in touch with it. And it just keeps bubbling along there without boiling over and spilling out. These are the lucky ones. Locked in this storage container, I recognized that I was no longer one of these lucky ones. My humanity had been stripped from me, excised like a tumor. So, what matters now? Nothing. Nothing matters now. Except... Revenge. No escape. No hope. They wanted a butcher? An exterminator? They'd get one. I'd watch and wait for a chance, and when I got it, I'd dismantle this organization piece by piece, like a slab of meat in a slaughterhouse. The hallucinations continued. Sweaty and delirious, I lie on the bed that felt like it was made of pulsing awful. I watched miniature disembodied legs, severed at the torso, dance an intricate ballet on my stomach. Spiders and centipedes poured from the walls. Time lost all meaning. I'd done just about every drug known to man, but never had I experienced such a visceral, horrifying, or persistent break from reality as the one from the cocktail they had given me. I rocked back and forth and sang to myself to try and cling on to my sanity. I've got no strength to hold me down to make me fret or make me frown. I had strings, but now I'm free. There are no strings on me. Thanks for listening, and thank you once again to my friend Andrew Parker. For this incredible series, he has another one coming up, folks. This was just the setup, as you can see, setting up for some pretty um, gross things in the future. And I'm very excited to put the gross sounds to those gross words. And you can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Scare You to Sleep. I almost said my personal handle, sorry. Uh, at Scare You to Sleep. If you want to follow me personally, you can follow me at Shelby B. Scott on all of those, as well as on Blue Sky. I'm on there as well. And you can, if you have a story, if you'd like to uh, become the next Andrew Parker and have people uh, send you such lovely notes and such lovely kind messages about your work, you can send them into Scare You to Sleep at gmail.com. And that was a joke, of course. Andy and I have received some (laughs) interesting messages, to say the least. But that's okay. We are who we are. And I'm very excited to see you at Midsummer Scream, Andy. So, hey, come on down. If you'd like to personally tell Andrew Parker to his face that, or exactly how you feel about this series, he'll be at Midsummer Scream, too. Um, So come hang out with us. Come see my panel, and uh, the times apparently are moving around a little bit, so if you go to the Midsummer Scream app, you can actually heart my panel and any other panels I'm doing, and it'll give you a little alert the day of and let you know, like, hey, this panel's coming up soon, and it just gives me an idea of how many people are showing up, and it makes me feel really great that it's not zero. At least it doesn't seem like it's going to be. So yeah, I'm doing a panel by myself, 
I might have some guests, actually. I think I'm going to bring up some guests for my hour-long panel, and that's really exciting. I'm going to keep those a secret. And for my other panel, this Internet Urban Legends, and I'm going to be doing that with John Grills, Trevor Henderson, the creator of Siren Head, and Pacific S. Obadiah, who will be moderating. And I will also be hosting the Slumber Party for Midsummer Scream After Dark on Saturday night, and I just got my outfit. Oh my god, it's so cute. I'm so excited to wear it. I can't wait to show you. It's it's scary to sleep colors, and I'm very excited. So come to the slumber party with me where we're going to watch a movie. There's going to be a seance. There's going to be a DJ. We're going to be dancing. And what else? There's something else. I feel like I'm missing something else. Oh, there's a costume party where you can win $500. If you win, you get $500. And I'm going to be one of the judges for the costume party. So come on by to Midsummer Scream. I'm so excited. It's in two weeks. And the closer it gets the more excited I am, and I am just so jazzed to get to see some of you. I'll also be hanging around the Bloody Disgusting booth. There's a Bloody Disgusting slash um, uh, Scream Box booth that's going to be there, so I'll be around there too as well. And if you would like to see me and you can't find me, go drop by that booth and ask whoever is there, and they'll probably have an idea of where I am. And yeah, so I'll be there Friday night to go watch my friend John from Creepy do his panel, and I will be there every day, every day that weekend. I'm so excited. Uh, so yeah, come see me. Let's see, what else do I need to let you know? Oh, Patreon patrons, um, I just got in a new batch of stickers that I, can, I can't pick them up until Monday, but I will pick them up, and so the rest of the stickers will be going out soon. And also, oh yeah, if you, for anyone who doesn't know, on Patreon, you get these ad-free. And yes, you've enjoyed a few weeks of free of ads since I moved to a new hosting site and I'm waiting to get approved for new ads to start showing up. So wasn't this nice? Wasn't it great? Wasn't it great to not have ads? So if you want this experience to keep on rolling, go over to patreon.com and for as little as a dollar a month, you can get ad free episodes and as little as $3 a month, you can get bonus episodes. So see you there at Patreon. And I believe that is it for now. Oh, go listen to Historic Hangouts. I'm going to plug my other show. Go listen to Historic Hangouts, the other show I do where we talk about historic hangouts and the people who historically hung out at them. The last one we did was on a tavern in Mississippi where they found skeletal remains in the walls. So head over there. Uh, give us a, a review um, of this show as well. You can review on Spotify. and Well, you can review everywhere. Just Spotify is the one I pay attention to. And yeah, let's see. That's about it. And for the ramble, I'm not going to ramble too much this week. This episode took me a long time. And I have been suffering from executive dysfunction as well as I was out of town taking care of my mom, my dear old mom, because she had surgery and I was out of town for most of this week doing that. So I got a little behind, a little behind. My schedule has been a little bit all over the place this month. It always, it feels like it seems, it tends to happen during the summer, the early summer that my schedule gets a little wacky. So I apologize for that, but don't worry. Do not fret. I will be uh, uploading a new guided nightmare soon, new bonus episodes coming for Patreon. And so I will see you next week and hopefully in two weeks in person at Midsummer Scream. All right, remember to wear your sunscreen, drink some water, go get some sleep, and sweet dreams. <laughs>